We're here at the NAC Show. This is the largest ever NAC Show for the world's biggest ever convenience industry event. I'm joined by Klaus Mantel at Shell, Joe Barrett from Apple Green, Victor Paterno from 7-Eleven, and Matt Danielson from Liquids Barcodes. Welcome, gentlemen. The world of convenience has never been more vibrant and it's changing at pace. Consumers are ever more time pressured, they're more discerning and they're more sophisticated and the industry has to gear up to match those expectations globally. This is Nax's largest show ever. But what do you make of it? Joe? The best thing that has happened this year is the international board has been recognised and it's really recognising the fact that there's different parts of the industry. So we've got a sort of a European and an Asian influence now in the business and it's not just all about America. And I think there's a lot of to learn from outside of America and we're all just combining and sharing ideas and I think that to me has been the best of this, this show so far. And Matt, what do you make of the NAC show this year? You know, you come every year. What's, uh, what's your gut feel for this year's show? Uh, what I like is the, uh, the speakers, so the, uh, all the, the sessions that have actually been set up with the International Hub. Uh, so a lot of good talks there. Uh, obviously also the education sessions, uh, where you can pick and choose the, uh, the topics that you're interested in. Uh, that's where, where I like to uh, get inspirations and uh, get some good, good best practices understood. So. Yes, yes, and as ever, a big, a big mm. shell contingent here, True. class. Um, what, what are you guys uh, finding from the show so far? I think for me, three things stand out. I think first is innovation, uh, innovation in what we call core convenience, uh, drinks, snacks, tobacco, a lot of exciting new developments uh, by the product manufacturers. I think the second point is food service. Uh, everybody's on it, uh, everybody wants to grow. And the third one is disruption. Uh, that came home yesterday with a great session with an Airbnb presenter. Uh, you see this is a sense of anxiety in the industry, especially around fuels, um, e-vehicles. I think the future seems quite certain for the next five years. Beyond that, uh, we're all looking what, what's going to happen, right? And so in that sense, it's great to be here because the future happens in many places in parallel and we can learn a lot from each other. Well, the future of food, I mean, let's latch on to that, uh, that, that is because it's a key one, isn't it? You know, are we in the restaurant game? In our business, we, uh, we target to have sort of 30% of our gross margin from food, 30% from the sea store and 30% from fuel. And that's how we insulate ourselves against um, the ongoing sort of electric vehicles and, and altern alternative fuels. But just one thing I would have noticed about the food service here is that if you're in Europe, I think it's a lot more about healthy food and salads and organic. And I don't think the NAC show still has got that far yet. And I think there's an opportunity to really drive that side of food service and to bring on more and more healthy food, which is what the customer is looking for. Yeah. Seems to be in going in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, from what I understand from, from NAC, it's, uh, it's the biggest part yeah. now with food service. It's never been bigger uh, at the NAC show. Yeah. Uh, but I agree, uh, it's, it's a bit of a different uh, yeah. product, uh, more pizzas, more uh, rolls and so on, and less salads and less uh, mm. food, food options, really, than what you see in yeah. Apple Green or you see in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose, you know, on the, uh, uh, the question is, are we in the restaurant game? You know, I've been to a lot of stores where we did our Philadelphia study tour sheets and Wawa and Rutter's, and, you know, they have, they have restaurants with 30 seats in them. Um, Victor, I mean, you know, are you, are you in the restaurant business in the Philippines? Yes and no. Um, we... We have seating in all stores, uh, and it is not bar seat. It's not just bar seating. Um, we only have 120 square meters, so we usually have just a few tables. But um, we do sell a lot of rice meals. So 25% of our sales are uh, food service. Um, and my impression walking the walking the show is that it's really really hard to get into food service if you don't operate your own chill distribution. Um, if you're relying on a vendor to drop off, then it, I can see the, the, the point of like renting to a Subway or Pizza Hut or whoever. Uh, without that cold supply chain where you can get from multiple vendors and have daily delivery, it's really difficult to get into food service. And what about in some of your stores, class? And I know you have, you have a, is it a, you call it a food oasis? True, yeah. I think what we find in food, it's, it's location specific. Uh, we have what we call the food oasis in places like Malaysia, a multi-branded food court, many, many things. And people go there just to spend an hour, an hour or two 
uh, children doing their homework, uh, people taking a break. Uh, on the other hand, we have grab and go locations. Uh, people want to get in and out in two minutes, and so it really is location specific. Uh, but what strikes me in the world of, of forecourt retailing is the trends are universal. I was in Pakistan the other day, I was drinking a, a kale shake uh, juice kind of, uh, and it was amazing. Uh, and I think it was really nice. Uh, and this is in Karachi, uh, where you would probably not necessarily expect that. Uh, you think about the yeah, San Francisco, sure. Uh, so where those trends are global, also in China we see the same. Yeah, so that is fascinating yeah, that everybody's on the same trend towards health, uh, but it differs. Uh, and then the US market uh, is also quite uh, unevenly distributed yeah. in terms of where, where that's happening now and where it probably will come later. I suppose, I mean, you have a great global perspective, of course. I mean, how many countries uh, are you operating in now? I mean, the Shell brand is in over 80 countries yes. and growing. Yes. We're entering about 10 yes. countries in, in, in about yes. two years. Yes. Um, we operate our own stores in 25, yes. uh, and it's yes. truly global. Yes. Uh, so in that sense, we get a lot of benefit yes. from sharing learnings between markets. Yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, the trends are the same. I mean, the pace is different. Yes. Um, yeah. Yes, yes. And Joe, I mean, you're global yourself these days. Yeah, yeah, we've expanded recently into um, into the southeast of um, of the United States down in uh, Columbia, the capital of South Carolina, and we're delighted with that acquisition. And one of the things we find with our food service, Dan, is that we have a combination approach. So we combine with brands like Subway, Burger King, uh, Blimpy, and Costa Coffee, that type of idea. And then also we have our own brand, which we call Bakewell. So we do our own coffee and our own pastries. And similar to Victor, we have our own distribution system in I was Ireland. I ask that question. Yeah. That's yeah, and it's absolutely, absolutely, absolutely critical, critical. To, to have that distribution, to have your daily delivery so you have fresh and healthy products for the customer every every single day. And that's that's a key to the to have your infrastructure. And um, that is something that we're going to try and establish now further in the UK and to try and help and grow our, our business, our partner with people who can give us that distribution. So I think, you know, sorry, Victor. Yeah, no, just to add to that, we've, we've actually yeah. taken that a step further. And, and we, act, we have a chill distribution, which is every day, and we have a fried product distribution, which is three or four times a day, from a new, because fried doesn't last very long. Wow. Uh, our competitor, one out of every two times a Filipino eats out, he eats fried chicken. So you have yeah. to carry fried chicken. Yeah. But if you look at the cost of, care, of producing that in the store, it's astronomical. Um, it's a, we, we studied it, it's below break even yeah. uh, for our competitor. So we have this thing where a motorcycle delivers it, which probably only works for an emerging market. But I think that, because uh, we really don't want to prepare in the store. In, so in that sense, we're not a restaurant. Uh, we, we, we sell food like a restaurant, but I think to prepare food like a restaurant would be a huge mistake because those costs are very high. Yeah. I think it's something that's really important for people in our sector as well is to embrace food and to really understand it and not to kind of give it off to somebody else and rent out their space because our sector is under pressure from margin pressure from electric vehicles, changes in sort of government, um, sort of changes with uh, cigarette legislation, alcohol legislation, sugar taxes come into Ireland. So I think you have to embrace food and really, uh, really get behind it. And we use a terminology in our business, we call our coffee black gold. So we have to really know the coffee and, and mind it and, and look after it. So. You put a barrel valuation on coffee yeah, as well, which yeah. I always love yeah, that yeah, analogy, yeah. don't you? True. Yeah. Now our EVP is talking about this as a $2,000 barrel. Yeah. In terms yeah. of, and that, <laughs> and that, that works. Yeah, that yeah. Is, that really, he's, a, he's a clever guy, isn't he? Because know, that's yeah. the language to talk, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. The oil company yeah. that, that mm. resonates, right? Yeah. Yeah, but just on the food thing, I think what we find is that if you can prepare it in front of the eyes of the customer, yes. that is very powerful. Mm -hmm. yeah, so we've just launched Delhi by Shell in Singapore. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the restaurant or the, the kitchen is in the middle of the store. Yeah. Yeah, so everything that happens, you see happening. Mm -hmm. yes. And also what we find is the whole made-to-order piece. And yeah. in the Netherlands, also Delhi by Shell, you can say, I want this bread, I want smoked salmon, a bit of butter, yeah, and then some lettuce. Yeah, yeah. 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 And it's a high quality product, yeah. isn't it? And yeah. it's made to order, so it, it's a choice. Is it delivery, is it made on site? But you can only do that on big sites with big turnover. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's as usual. Uh, it is, it is, uh, but it's not, it's not easy to make it profitable because yeah. uh, yes. your cost can be very high, yeah. waste, uh, and that's, that's again the location specific issue. Because uh, doing food service is one thing, making money out of it uh, yes. and doing it well is harder. Yeah, we've made big mistakes. Uh, we're getting a bit better in terms of location mm. uh, selection based on analytics, uh, customer missions. Uh, but yeah, it's but it's it's you have to do this. Uh, certain locations, customers expect uh, made-to-order product, and it's uh, 
it's very motivating for the staff as well uh, because they become more baristas, uh, food service um, uh, professionals. So it, it has multiple benefits, uh, but yeah, it's the way we have to go.